Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great pleasure to be here at Davos uh, with Mario Draghi, president of the European Central Bank. On a personal note, uh, I should say that I've known Mario for more than 20 years. Uh, when I first met him, he was a senior official at the Italian Treasury, one of a group of European technocrats, if I could use that word, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, who were involved in putting together the architecture of the single currency. That was back in 1996. Today, uh, he is in charge of the European Central Bank, at the heart of macroeconomic policy making and at the heart of the current crisis. Uh, it could be a crisis of confidence, could be many other things, but we're going to talk about some of these things over the next half hour. Um, Mr. President, if, if we could just start with the, the important uh, interest rate hike by the Federal Reserve last December, many people thought at the time that this signaled, if you like, uh, the beginning of the end of unconventional monetary policy and that as a means of generating economic growth, this was a sea change. Looks slightly different today. How do you see the picture? Did that single a, a, a very important shift? Well, it signaled the, um, the improvement of the economic situation, uh, especially in the United States, but to a somewhat uh, lesser extent also in the rest of the world. Um, we uh, usually don't comment on, uh, on, on other central banks' decisions. As someone said in England, in a different context, we don't do central banks. Um, he said something else, of course, but the yes. We don't do religion. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. Um, but one has to say that uh, uh, the decision the Fed took was, uh, was, was appropriate given the position of the US economy, the recovery cycle, and it was uh, perfectly communicated and flawlessly executed. So uh, you'll forgive me for doing central bank once in a while, but I think that's fully, fully deserved. Now, you obviously uh, made some important statements yesterday, and you've You've put me under severe pressure not to pressure you, or not you, but the, to repeat the very carefully parsed performance of yesterday. But can you give us a sense from the ECB, you know, given the Fed decision, how, how concerned are you that there, there seems to be a, a slight m misalignment between the way American monetary policy is going and the way European and Japanese monetary policy? Well, I don't think there is, uh, um, well, let me step back. The, the different monetary policies reflect the different positions of the economies in the recovery cycle. The US recovery is more advanced than what's happening in, in the Euro area and in Japan. And so it's entirely natural that monetary policies uh, do differ and uh, they will uh, be on, uh, on a diverging path for, for a while. And um, so, uh, I, and, and, and this will be reflected in different interest rates, but uh, it's a normal process. So the, the spillovers between the two major jurisdictions uh, would be adequately coped if the monetary policy decisions are right. But do you think that something profound has changed in 2016? Uh, you know, 15. So, no, well, 16. The, the new okay. year for many people has started very badly. Yeah. I'm not just talking about the stock markets, but there seems to be a, a different assessment of economic prospects, not just in China, but also even in America, where people generally thought the recovery was, st was steady and underway. What's happened in the new year of 2016 that seems to have changed sentiment? Well, I think it's too early to speak about change in sentiment. Uh, there, are, there are market uh, vibrations, gyrations. There are uh, 
there is certainly a, a heightened sensitivity to risk. Um, but it's too early to say the perspectives have changed. The, um, as far as we are concerned, uh, we basically um, see a recovery that is continuing uh, at the modest pace, but regular one. Uh, it's, mo it's a recovery that's driven by consumption, differently from, uh, from uh, other occasions in the past, where it was driven, there was more recoveries, they wouldn't last long, driven especially by exports. Now it's been driven by consumption. And uh, the drivers of this economy, of this recovery, are uh, first and foremost, I'll say, our monetary policy. And to also, to a great extent, by oil prices that support real disposable income. And also by the fact that the overall stance of fiscal policy in the euro area has become broadly neutral, if not slightly expansionary. And um, so all these three drivers w should ensure a continuation of the recovery. Uh, the, there is one fourth driver ahead, which, is, which hasn't still yet deployed its, uh, its effect. And that is the... Um, the probable increase in government expenditure that will be necessary to cope with the refugees in, in, the, in Europe, really. So on the, on the growth, on the growth on the upper side, uh, I don't think there is any reason to think that perspectives have changed. On the inflation side, however, things are different. And uh, I've been commenting on that, on that quite extensively in, uh, in the past few days. But uh, certainly the situation is, um, sort of, uh, is, uh, gives less reason to be optimistic for the time being. Is that largely because of the collapse in oil prices, or are there other factors? It's mostly because of the collapse in oil prices, but also because of the, um, of the revision, of the downward revision in the growth perspectives of the emerging market economies, which, by the way, will certainly have an is certainly having an impact on, on oil and commodity prices as well. And um, so the issue there is how... Uh, we, look, we look basically at three factors there. First of all, we look at what we call materiality, namely the size of these effects, and then we look at how persistent they are. Of course, it's very different if they are temporary. And, and, and third, and most important, we look at what we call second round effects, namely how these lower oil prices feed into the prices of, um, of other components of the inflation of the price index basket, namely services, manufacturing, and so on. So that's what, what we look at. Uh, I'd like to ask you a non-economic question, if I may. Well, it's a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> I just wonder whether sometimes, from your perspective, we just expect too much of central bankers. Very difficult to answer. You know, I think people, most people, certainly central bankers, um, try to perform their tasks at their best. Try to do what is necessary based on the analysis and assessment of the situation. And um, try to assess also the, the risks that their policy measures would entail, the so-called side effects. But in the end, they are bound by a mandate. And... Um, so this is a relevant question, uh, but it should not be used as a pretext not to act. Uh, it should not be used to say that, I'm sorry, it's not my responsibility, it's yours. The uh, first and foremost obligation that all central bankers have is to act based on their mandate, which in our case is price stability. You've been very clear about that. Uh, but let me just go back to that point I made at the beginning, 
which is you were one of the co-architects, along with Jean-Claude Trichet, Nigel Wicks, uh, and others who put together the, the blueprint under political instruction for the Euro. Do you feel a kind of strong, deep, abiding personal commitment to try to keep the Euro together? Is there something else motivating you? Or is it just that mandate? Well, you're actually, I mean, probably, we were not the architects. We were humble bureaucrats at the time. We were actually... Uh, Emphasis on humble. Humble, yes, exactly. <laughs> Emphasis on humble. And, and as you said, we were actually executing instructions, again, at our best. Um, and certainly, we all feel committed. I haven't seen Nigel now for many years, but I'm pretty sure if... Uh, if we were to meet, he would feel equally committed to the European project as I do, or Jean-Claude Trichet does. And he's British. And he's British, that's right. That's a... that's a... <laughs> I so... promise not to ask you about Brexit. <laughs> right, please do, <laughs> please don't. <laughs> so uh, we, we, we do feel committed to the European project. We, we've all, uh, we, had, we spent most of our lives, really, working on it. So. But let me just go back to, again, something very interesting. Underreported uh, in the first few days of this year that Wolfgang Schäuble, a committed European too, has said twice that we shouldn't ask too much or put too much pressure on the European Central Bank. That, that must have been music to your ears. Well, it's certainly it's certainly the right thing to it's certainly the right thing to say. It's an appeal to his colleagues, to the European leaders, to undertake the necessary reforms, to make the euro area more homogeneous, and more competitive, and more resilient mm. eventually to all shocks in the future, then, and certainly more resilient than it was b before the crisis. Because in a way, um, Mr. President, the, what you and your colleagues, because I, I stress this is a, it's a collective body at the European Central Bank, that your pledge of, uh, to do whatever it takes is essentially not a, a means of creating space for the politicians to act, to take the supply side reforms to generate economic growth. Is that, is that the way, right way to see it? Well, you see, again, it's a very political way to look at things. I, I just, uh, I, I kind of, um, when, I can only restate what I said before. Namely, we look at what needs to be done based on our mandate. Mm. Now, whether this buys political time to do the reforms or not, uh, it may well be. Uh, but it's not a relevant aspect as far as we are concerned. It's really, it's, uh, it's really up to the others to act mm. and to decide whether they have enough time or not. Uh, but it's not up to the central bank mm. to have these considerations in mind when we decide monetary policy. Um, but to use the analogy, which is sometimes used of the US Supreme Court, uh, you are not at the central bank, monks in cells? No, certainly not. But we, uh, we've got to be careful that uh, to have our attention and focus on the mandate right. and uh, not to get lost mm -hmm. into the many, many other political considerations that would uh, lead us to deviate from uh, our mandate. Right. OK, let's turn to the question of well, it's not a question, it's, a, it's probably one of the most serious issues facing the European Union today, which is the refugee crisis. I mean, extraordinary numbers of people coming into the European Union, particularly Germany. One million this last year, perhaps another million this year. Do you see this as a, an existential threat to the European Union? in the sense that Schengen may well be suspended, uh, threat to the single market, or do you see this as perhaps an opportunity? Let me say that each time I'm asked a question about this problem, I kind of, uh, the first reflection that comes to my mind is how narrow and limited 
is an economist's perspective with respect to this and how little we know about this issue. What, what the refugees are for Europe uh, are both a challenge and an opportunity. It's a challenge for sure, and it would be foolish to ignore the size, the extent of the challenge. Our society will be changed by this. In which direction, we can only guess. It's also premature to know how long it will take to transform this challenge in an opportunity. But if uh, there is determination and confidence, you see, that, that's the most important thing. Because the size of the challenge could actually undermine the confidence, in, make fear prevailing over any other consideration, and then the challenge is lost. I don't think we are there. Actually, we are all working to make it into an opportunity. And, um, and I think if, if we go back to the, what I was saying, hinting at before about the recovery, the um, expenditure, the government expenditure that will be needed to cope with this challenge could actually turn out to be the large public investment project we had, we had for an, a great number of years. And possibly, as you say, an extra stimulus to growth, because actually the growth story in the, Europe, in the Eurozone over the last 10 years has been pretty, pretty poor. I mean, to quote Larry Summers, terminally tepid growth. <laughs> yes, yes. And certainly one of the reasons for such low growth is the, is the demographics. It certainly doesn't, doesn't help. And, and this might change. But again, uh, we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't ignore the size of the challenge, the difficulty of this challenge, namely, and that has to do with a variety of things, the degree of education of the, of the refugees, the age, and the countries themselves, uh, especially, I would say, the countries themselves, how prepared they are, how willing they are to invest in this project, um, how organized they are, the impression is that, and, and, and finally, and, and, pra and perhaps right now, even most importantly, how willing they are to cooperate. Because it's quite clear that without cooperation, this becomes a challenge that's hardly won. There hasn't been much cooperation so far, though, on the refugee crisis. In terms of European burden sharing, it's not happened. Well, it, it, it's... Uh, I think it will happen. I'm actually pretty confident that mm. it will happen, that uh, the a reasonable agreement will be found. And, and, and the reason why I'm confident is the, ultimately, the inevitability of this phenomenon will make people understand that there is no choice other than coping with uh, vision, boldness, courage, without fear, with the, with the process itself. If not, you, co not to cooperate means to ignore hmm. the challenge. And, uh, and to ignore it, that will not make it disappear. If we look back just a year ago, all the talk was about Grexit. That seemed to be the existential question for the European or the Eurozone uh, 12 months ago. Much has happened since. Terrorist attacks, as you say, the refugee crisis. Can we just have a word on Grexit? Is that now off the table? Well, we are in a much better situation than we were, uh, say, last June. Um, the Greek government undertook significant progress, made significant progress in, uh, in making uh, reforms in uh, fiscal consolidation. Um, and what we call the two sets of milestones of this, uh, of this program have been, have been achieved. Uh, negotiations are taking place this very moment. Uh, there are mostly, I would say, three areas where the, uh, where the discussions are taking place. 
One is uh, what are going to be the fiscal targets uh, for 2018 and 19. The second point is the pension reform, which seems to be a, a, a key point in the policy discussions, namely that the pensions, well, it's very simple to say, and of course it's very difficult to do, but it, namely that the pension system should be sustainable. And, and the third point is uh, the um, financial sector reforms. Now, Greek banks have been capitalized, and, um, and now, but there's still, there is still a high level of non-performing loans. So how to deal with this problem will require some changes in the financial legislation and uh, a process whereby these loans could be sold so that the uh, banks could actually fully engage in uh, giving credit to the private sector of the Greek economy. Uh, discussions, as I said, are taking place at this very moment. I'm pretty, pretty sure that an agreement will be found so that the first review could be successfully concluded in, in uh, speedily and successfully concluded. And speed is of the essence, by the way, because uh, the sooner this is concluded, the sooner the Greek economy will go back to, no, to, a, to a normal situation where the private sector will get credit, but also the government will get enough financing to undertake the public investment projects that, uh, that, Greek need, that Greece needs. One of the problems, of course, is, is uh, uh, I think it was George Soros said last night, uh, Greece is a nation with no state. I'm not sure I understand. Uh, well, is George in the audience? No, he's not. No. Uh, I mean, the, the problem, I, th this is actually, he didn't say that. I just misquoted him. Sorry, George. Um, the, the problem being that the state just isn't strong enough. Yeah, but that can be said on many other countries. I mean, just. What, <laughs> uh, why, why are you looking at me? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I, I think that was. Yeah. That was a central banker's elliptical comment about <laughs> Scottish independence. <laughs> no. <laughs> Don't make me say things. <laughs> uh, if you look forward, though, to 2016, um, what, what, what are the, the priorities for the central bank? Well, I, I kind of briefly mentioned them before. I mean, just the, as far as we are concerned, the continuation of the economic recovery and second, the um, convergence of the inflation path towards our objective of rate of inflation, which is close but below 2%. It's as, <clears throat> and as you say, you are somewhat short of that 2% target. Indeed. <laughs> Just how much ammunition have you got in your pocket? Well, we... We have plenty of instruments. I've, I made these comments yesterday during the press conference, so there's no point in repeating them, but uh, we, have, we have plenty of instruments. And, um, and especially, we have the, um, the determination and the willingness and the capacity of the governing council to act and deploy these instruments. Uh over the last four years, well, it's, it's three and a half years or so since you've been in, in office. Longer. It's longer, it's four years. Longer, four and, four and four three and months. He's, by the way, th this is, this is the, the, the closest you'll get to a central banker's confession. He's counting every minute. <laughs> <laughs> but has there anyth been anything, I know you don't normally in, engage in such things, but if you could share with this audience, is there one or two things that you've learned or that have surprised you since arriving in Frankfurt? Well, I, I, I don't know, I really. I mean, I, 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 I had many jobs in my life, and this was a question I was, I was often asked, was there anything that surprised you in this job? And I was never able to answer, really. It's probably, things do surprise me after they have <laughs> happened. But uh, at the time, I mean, to, 
I, I, I have no idea. I mean, you see, uh, in, uh, if you live in the present, you're hardly surprised. And this you're, is a job where you do have to live in the present. Uh, I, uh, yeah, it's be better, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's probably better than living in the past. <laughs> I want to just ask you one, one more technical question, yeah. um, Mr. President. Th this is this issue of banking supervision. Uh, at the moment, there are, there are new rules which have come into place on bail-ins for banks and the assessment of non-performing loans. And you've had a, quite a serious problem in Portugal and an issue also in, in Italy, in your native country. Uh, it's always difficult, by the way, for the head of the central bank to how he deals with or she deal, would deal with, with, the, with the country back home. But can you, can you just tell us, I mean, is the central, is the ECB a lit, see this question of heavy banking supervision something as a poison chalice or, or what? Um, oh, just since you mentioned the two countries, first of all, it, the, the two situations are different. But one thing that's probably not sufficiently considered is that um, the ECB is not the resolution authority. So uh, that means that the way these bail-ins are being implemented in different countries depends first and foremost on the resolution authority, which until the end of last year was the national authority. And there is no uniform rule or regulation until now, that tells how to implement bail-ins in the same way across different countries. So you had one way was done in Portugal. We get another country, they may well do it a different way. And so my, my auspice, my, my, my wish would be that the current directive then is translated into a regulation which actually ensures uh, uniformity of, uh, of bail-in implementation across countries. Now, having said that, now there was a big confusion, I think, in, uh, in my native country. And um, uh, the, the key thing is we did, as a supervisor, we did the comprehensive assessment, uh, which terminated a few months ago. This assessment of the bank's situation in the whole of the euro area identified fully all the MPLs at that time and uh, identified the necessary provisions and the necessary capital increases following that assessment. Now the SSM, the supervisor, sent uh, a questionnaire which apparently was read as implying new requests. Yeah. It was, there was a mistaken reading. Yeah. Uh, the questionnaire only wanted to look on how banks deal with MPLs. Because we are the first to be aware that it takes years to deal with the MPLs. It's not a matter that can be dealt with urgency. It's a good example, it's given by Ireland. Ireland has been struggling with the MPLs for years. And they, so the uh, supervisor's objective was to see what are the different national practices that are used to deal with MPLs. And then later on, we could orient towards the best practices. Nothing more than that. So there's not going to be any new unexpected request of provisions or capital coming stemming from this exercise. And I did say this in pretty clear terms yesterday, and I restated today. Thank you. Um, I'd like to now uh, ask what might be described as a historical philosophical question. If you look at Treaty of Rome, first invoked the notion of an ever closer union. And if you look at the evolution of the European Union over the years, you've had the single market and then the single currency. And Looking at the Eurozone, we talked about this principle of convergence. Do you now, looking back and living in the present as you do, 
do, do you think that this notion of linear development is actually wrong? It's not all moving towards an ever closer union. It's something different. Well, I think uh, I uh, I would I would uh, I don't think people when when they said ever closer union, I don't think they had in mind a linear process. Uh, they had in mind a process which probably because these people were reasonably intelligent, they would uh, they would also imagine as quite bumpy, and that's what we are living through. But it's no, it's no question, even in the, in, a certain, in the account you just made about the fact that this union has become closer and closer through going through one crisis after another one. And uh, I think uh, someone said, don't let uh, don't let a good crisis waste, or don't waste a good, don't waste a good crisis. I think you're, you're quoting Churchill again. Yeah, but, but wrongly, I guess, not, not no, exactly. No. <laughs> Something. Well, anyway. you need a pipe. I need a pipe. <laughs> good, I'm just conscious of time. Um, but the, just the, the, if you think of events today, this is, we are living in a, in, a, in a crisis. If you think of the refugee problem, the terrorist attacks in Paris, the notion that Schengen may be, or it's suspended in name. I mean, these are really multiple threats to, to the process. And, and in that sense, it's me talking, not you. It, it puts almost a bigger premium on, inst on the institutional, on the institutions that you have as a, as a kind of force for stability. Is that something you'd be able to comment on or? I can, I can actually make a, a short comment on that. It's, uh, it's certainly true. It is certainly <laughs> true. It's, um, it's a moment uh, when, um, when uh, all the European leaders, um, are trying to are trying to drive their people closer to the common European interest in a way that is respectful of democracy. What has changed uh, uh, with the crisis, and what what is always true with crisis, is that there can't be a purely elitarian process towards elitist, yeah. elitist mm. process towards but has to be a fully democratic <clears throat> process and that's what's happening that's what crises actually produce often and that's why after each crisis is coped and resolved the democracies are stronger and the common effort the common journey towards a closer union is getting more and more determined. Mario Draghi, thank, thank you. I won't call you Super Mario, but... Uh, no, please. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Mario Draghi, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed the conversation. It's been very good to see you. Thank you. Thank you.